谢的卖团，感谢甜点，感谢 David， 感谢各位的支持。那么在稍后还会有这《华尔街联报》跟大家。哎，唠唠这个时下更流行的各类的话题。嗯，《华尔街年报》今天有一篇台北的节目跟大家推荐啊，就是我们的年轻的记者啊，那么去采访啊一位教授，主要讲一九六八年的美国在芝加哥召开的民主党大会和今天正在芝加哥召开的民主党大会的啊，哎，在什么地方？时代的变化在什么地方？这是一个你了解美国政治、了解现在的民主党大会的一个非常具有水理性的、思辨性的这么一个节目，特别推荐给大家。好，不要错过。那接下来就请大家这个进入《华尔街联报》来收看下面的内容。《华尔街论坛》会在明天继续回归，我们不见不散。Hi everyone, this is Lao Wan reporting for Huar Jie Qian Xian. Today we're interviewing Nicholas Proctor, who teaches 18th and 19th century American history at Simpson College. He earned his PhD in history from Emory University and has since published a book, Hunting and Mastery in the South, as well as writing and co-writing four titles in the Reacting to the Past series. Reacting uses role-playing games with primary source texts to teach undergraduate students about history. Hi, Nick. Welcome to our show. Hey, it's good to be here.、Um, I wanted to start with、um, some levity in your bio on the Simpson website. Under expertise, game design is listed above 18th and 19th American history. Is that I assume that's intentional? That's not a typo. That's right. A, a lot of it is because I'm going into my 26th fall at Simpson, and it's very much a teaching institution. So as time has passed, I've become much more of a specialist in teaching than in historical research. I I still do historical research, but、uh, I I did that level、uh, to show what I spend most of my time doing. Gotcha. But we、uh, we were talking earlier about how we'll probably have to have a whole other conversation about your book, Hunting and Mastery in the South, and why it's so relevant. But about the reacting games, could you maybe just explain what、um, reacting looks like in a classroom? Like, how does that work?、Um, sure.、Yeah. The、uh, every reacting game starts with a few sessions that look pretty much like a typical college classroom, where the instructor is lecturing and leading discussion about a historical moment and giving historical context. That's the point at which things change because the professor gives the students role sheets that give them the roles that they'll be playing during the game, and informed by those discussions at the before the game started, they're then going to act as if they're in a historical situation. So one of my favorite games is set in democratic Athens. In the Athenian Assembly, so instead of lecturing about that and showing powerpoints about that, the students become Athenians, and they argue about the different issues that are facing Athens, and、um, they try to resolve them.、Uh, sometimes they do that peacefully, but other times it is a bit of a mess. So then, does role playing history sort of open up? New avenues of explanation or exploration that, like a conventional lecture or seminar format, like can miss in studying. Yeah,、history? it does that in in two big ways. One way in designing the game it, that you have to be very attentive to as a game designer is you have to include the points of view that lost. Usually, when we're telling history in a more conventional way, we focus on the winners. We focus on the people whose outcomes prevailed, but in order to have a good game, you also need to have the losers. You need to have the people who are trying to obstruct change、uh, or prevent things from happening. So that's one of the things that you learn is just that there's not this inevitability of history folding itself out in a particular way. The the students all.
walk away with a much greater appreciation for contingency that the things that happened didn't have to happen that way. Uh, and I think that they also lose some of the arrogance of the present. I think it's really easy for college students to walk into a historical situation, look at it and say, well, basically these people are a bunch of idiots. Uh, that you know, uh, Otherwise, why would they do these things? When they play through a game and we get to the end and then do a debriefing, one of the things that they often find is that they have done less well than their historical counterparts did. So I think that that sometimes is, gives them some perspective on the past that's difficult to get otherwise, because they've actually had to be there walking around in the shoes of those historical actors. This also raises a point that we were talking about um, over email about ahistorical outcomes. Um, so is there sort of, there's in, in, because these are games, right? It's possible that the outcome of the game is not what actually happened in history, but is there some learning mechanism to that? Is it important that students like learn, oh, you know, it could have happened in other ways? What, what, is, uh, what is the educational component of an ahistorical um, reenactment or role play? Right. The, the phrase that we often use in reacting is the plausibility corridor. So you have to give room in your game for plausible outcomes. And somewhere in that corridor of plausibility is what actually happened. Uh, so it, it might be the case that your game has an outcome that models the history really closely. But it's important to have the possibility for ahistorical outcomes for a couple reasons. The first one is, is it honors the effort that students are putting into things. If you've been struggling for weeks to get a law passed, and then the hard hand of the instructor comes down and says, well, that's not going to happen because that's not what historically happened, that, that really takes the air out of everybody. Um, the other one is, back to that issue of contingency, for students to realize that what historically happened wasn't the only way that things could have gone. So in the debriefing, I think a lot of the learning for the game happens when you compare the historical outcome with the game outcome. And the students have a much bigger and deeper appreciation for why the historical actors did, did the things they did. Um, it's not just they're operating from the big book of fate that says we have to do these things, but instead they're making high stakes decisions in a situation where they don't know have all the information, but they still need to make decisions. It also makes me think sort of about the use of primary text in teaching history. I sort of remember that when I was studying history, I was having to struggle through really like, I would often find them dry texts, um, but I imagine that if you're interacting with them as like, you're, these are the stakes of a, a game I can win based on how I interpret or understand this text, you get more familiar with it and also see how it interacts with history better? Yeah, one of my favorite games is set in the court of the emperor of the late Ming. And uh, for that, the central text is Confucius's Analects. And in order to make an argument as a player in that game, you have to support whatever you want to do with one of the Analects. Um, so it's, it's interesting where at the beginning of the game, my students who are American and are almost universally unfamiliar with Confucius sort of see it as, see the Analects as sort of a book of aphorisms that are, that are just like the sorts of things you put on inspirational posters. Um, but when they're playing the game, uh, they start to see that the Analects have real power in terms of the way that you deploy them and interpret them. So it's not unusual at the end of that game for everybody in their little copy of the Analects to have dog-eared pages and little flags so that they kind of flip around uh, because it's like, ah, oh, I see that you use that, the pole star Analect. Well, let me come back at you uh, with this Analect about the Duke, Duke of Zhou. How do you like that? Uh, and it, 
turns the documents into something you can use rather than just something that you think about. Almost as if your students are learning to be proper Confucian scholars in, in how they're handling these texts. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that, and that's an interesting game because it it's a game where the protocols of interaction are very important. So the Athenian democracy game is, is sort of crazy and chaotic because Athenian democracy was crazy and chaotic. Um, when you're one of the general secretaries of the Ming court, decorum is very important. Body language is very important. So I think that that's one of the things that my students also benefit from the different games in is just thinking about how they carry themselves and that that has meaning and it can have power. We were also earlier briefly talking about the uh, impact or influence of other games on the reacting series. I think you talked about role-playing games and other uh, computer games. Do you think that they influence the way that you design your games so that there is almost like a fun factor for the participation? Like how important is having fun, I guess, um, to the, the game and the educational component? Yeah, I think that having fun is hugely important for it uh, because it's what starts to turn the student motivation into intrinsic motivation. They they are trying to play the game and do well because they're having fun doing it and they're immersed in the game world. Um, so I think that that's really powerful. The, the, the tipping point that you have to watch when you're running or designing a game is that it becomes frivolous and they start joking around and they have dumb nicknames for each other and that kind of thing. So finding the place where it's fun, but it's serious fun is, uh, is one of the arts of running a game or designing a game, I think. Gotcha. So about the specific game that caught my attention um, and it's also been catching a lot of people's attention this year. It's um, Chicago 1968, about the 1968 election cycle, and also specifically the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Um, that election cycle has been drawing a lot of comparisons. Um, I think earliest in the year, Ezra Klein, when he called for an open convention and asked for Biden to step down, he referenced it several times in his article. Um, increasingly, we're seeing comparisons given that people are expecting protesters and also the uncommitted delegates within the convention. Um, also, 1968 was the last time a candidate won the Democratic nomination without competing in primaries. That's Hubert Humphrey. Um, also, uh, the incumbent president who was eligible for another term withdrew his bid for re-election. There was massive anti uh, nationwide anti-war protests. Um, against the war in Vietnam. And uh, I think this might be where things differ between 68 and 2024. Hubert Humphrey won the Democratic nomination, but then lost to Richard Nixon. Kamala Harris seems to be doing quite well in the polls right now. Um, and it's unclear. That's, that's the history that we're, that's in the making. The premise of the game, though, it seems to suggest that the convention itself had a huge impact on the overall election, that it was sort of a pivotal moment in the election cycle of that year. Could you maybe give us a little bit more context about how Hubert Humphrey won the nomination and also the system where there were only 13 primaries, even though there were 50 states? Right, well, it it, it is hugely pivotal in terms of the way that the Democrats select their candidates. Uh, and it was because the 1968 convention was a mess, the Democrats moved towards the primary intensive system that we have now. Uh, so the before this, primaries were, were innovative in a lot of ways and in 68 because the candidates had been picked by the party elite. So 1968 is this convention between systems where ultimately the party elite do pick Humphrey um, because of the way that it's structured. 
and uh, and this means that that he's able to become the candidate, even though he's a candidate that not many Democrats were excited about. Um, and through the next several elections, a number of reforms moved the Democrats closer and closer to totally relying upon primaries. Um, but even like uh, at, at different points in the Democratic convention, um, there have been super delegates for delegates that whose votes are are carry more weight than other delegates and and this kind of thing. So um, it's always been a kind of a hybrid. And the, the degree to which the delegates for individual states are going to cast votes according to their personal conscience, conscience versus the way that the party wants the things to go is uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. So uh, that's why it was so important for the Harris campaign to try to tie down as much support early uh, because they desperately wanted to avoid having an open convention because you never know what can happen in an open convention. It, in your describing of the system of nominating a candidate, it almost sounds like the game has made itself, that there is a sort of a gamification of how a candidate gets selected and the internal party politics. Um, do you think your students get the idea, the, the students that run through Chicago in 1968, they get the idea that to a certain extent, politicians are dealing with basically the same ru rules that they're they're playing with in the in their game. In a, in a macro sense, um, in in a micro sense, the specific rules, the specific way that representation is handled is different uh, from convention to convention. In my game, because the the main learning objectives that I have for my game are for the students to understand what the issues were in 1968. Um, I dispense with a lot of the protocols of the convention itself because it wasn't important for me that students learn about the nuts and bolts of the mechanisms of decision making. Um, so for that, there isn't like in 1968, historically, there was a platform committee and the platform committee really crafted what the platform was. In my game, I have some all convention votes to decide on different aspects of the platform. But that's because I wanted all the students to wrestle with that. Uh, and that's a way in which reacting games are different from things like Model UN or Moot Court, um, which rely, wh where the thing that they're trying to do is to teach students about how those institutions work. Reacting is much more about trying to get students to understand what the ideas were. So I bend the reality and acknowledge that I do that in the game book in order to get the students engaged in the in the big ideas. So if you don't mind, what what would you say are the big ideas of 68, the ones that sort of define that election cycle for the Democrats? Right. There, there's three. Um, the first one is what domestic policy is going to be is going to get the emphasis of the party. So these are the first few game sessions where the debate is between are the Democrats going to focus on poverty? Are they going to focus on civil rights? Are they going to focus on infrastructure or are they going to focus on law and order? So they have a lot of debates about those and eventually you're going to need to pick some priorities. The second big set of debates are about the Vietnam War and the and U.S. involvement there. And then the third big debate is who should the nominee for president be? Uh, so the nominee for president is, is more about how the party wants to project itself uh, by, by who it's going to be. But they're figuring out who the vice presidential candidate is, is an important part of the decision on the part of the president. And sometimes there's there's a, a mechanism in the game called the smoke-filled room, which is where the party elites can call a private meeting with no journalists to try to make some deals. Uh, and that's usually a real pivotal moment in the game. And usually the vice president comes out of one of those smoke-filled rooms 
um, having traded support in exchange for getting on the ticket. Also, one of it, within the the, I guess the basket of domestic policy, there were a whole bunch of problems, such as I think there was high unemployment, or at least high unemployment. Also, race was the key issue with Martin Luther King's assassination on April fourth. Um, right. and also a splintering of the Democratic Party, right? It seemed that um, that was the moment that the DNC decided to jettison its Southern Southern uh, voters that were pro-segregation. Yeah, and, and that's one of the tensions that they have to deal with in, in the game because a lot of the, the people, a lot of the players in the game, their main objective is to win the election in November. And they recognize that to win their election in November, they're going to have to get Southern whites to vote Democrat. And at this point, there was an, uh, George Wallace was a sort of an insurgent candidate who was a white supremacist populist. And they were worried that he was going to shave votes off of the Democrats um, be, because white Southerners would see the Democrats as being too devoted to civil rights. So this is, it's really interesting to see the way that students deal with this in the game, because they all know that this is the problem, but most of them, because they're students, but also because of the roles that they're playing, are reluctant to be that candid about their motivation. <laughs> so they come up with all sorts of reasons for like, no, no, infrastructure, that's really what we should focus on. Everybody likes roads and airports because if they throw support there, then it means that a slot isn't open for them to support civil rights. So what usually happens is they end up not supporting civil rights, but they also end up not supporting law and order. And instead they support infrastructure and anti-poverty methods. Uh, anti-poverty programs, because those are both broadly popular in the party. So so they go in that direction. How many times have you run Chicago 1968 and how many ahistorical outcomes have you encountered in those times? Right. I think that at this point, I've probably run it about 12 times. And of those, two of the runs that I did were with faculty at faculty development conferences. Um, for the outcomes, I think probably in about 80% of the games Nixon has won. Um, then in another 10%, now actually probably a little bit more than that, Humphrey probably wins about a quarter of the time. And then there are a handful, well, really there was only one time where there was sort of a weird outcome, which is Senator McCarthy, who's the big peace candidate, he got the nomination, but he was just a very, very clever student who cobbled together this coalition in order to, to get support. And because he was able to, he was, he was a favorite and he was able to use his real person charisma to convince the protesters to back off, um, they were not as active as they were historically. Uh, so, so this was sort of like the, the McCarthyite dream scenario coming real. Um, but uh, but it, it gave us the opportunity in the debriefing to talk about how in terms of his personality, McCarthy just didn't have the personality to do that. So um, I think that that was an interesting moment where the student realized that he had sort of done something that McCarthy, for personality reasons, wasn't capable of doing. Um, McCarthy was a very bookish, um, not in front of the cameras kind of a, kind of a person. So um, he, uh, yeah, so he. He was not a good presidential candidate, let's put it that way. But he represented the peace platform, which was very popular. So that also brings me to a question about transposing 68 onto 2024. Um, in 68, it, within the primaries, 
you know, the limited primaries that they had. The competing candidates were Hubert Humphrey, who represented LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson's um, pro-war stance, and RFK, um, John F. Kennedy's brother, Bobby, um, who was anti-war, and also Eugene McCarthy, who was the original anti-war candidate that saw competition after um, RFK joined. But within our current election cycle, it seems that within the primaries, the universal position on the massive anti-war protests throughout America uh, has been slightly appeasing, but no real stances. Do you think that there's been a, a narrowing of available politics since 1968? Or um, what do you think has changed? Yeah, I think there has been. I, I think the nature of the conflicts is pretty different um, because... For Vietnam, American newspapers are listing casualty figures every day of Americans that are being killed. So I think that for most Americans in 1968, the war is much closer uh, to, the, to them. There Certainly there are people who have family and friends and, and know people in Israel and Gaza, so they have a personal connection but it's something that a majority of Americans don't have. So uh, so I think that's different. Um, one of the other things is, in terms of the anti-war position in 1968, um, it's certainly there, but I think that it's tempting for us to imagine that the anti-war politicians are calling for a complete U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. They're really much more measured than that. Um, and it's a little bit like the, it's not unlike the position of the Biden administration now, uh, which is, well, we're in this and we're going to continue to sell arms, but at the same time, we're going to discourage the Israelis from using those arms and we're going to try to come to peace. So it's not, it it's it's a it's a more complicated position in the same way that McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy, the positions that they run on and they get a lot of support from the peace movement on, are not total withdrawal. They're about having a drawdown and entering into negotiations. So the 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 strong anti-war movement at the time, part of the reason why they show up at the convention in such large numbers in protest so loudly is they're not satisfied with McCarthy. Um, they don't think that any establishment politician is willing to go far enough. And they were calling for an immediate cessation of hostilities and an immediate withdrawal of US forces from Vietnam. And there are very few politicians in 1968 that are willing to publicly acknowledge that that's what might need to be done. Right. So the McCarthy stance was for a uh, uh, unconditional ceasefire. Was that, or or is that maybe the nitty gritty? Of yeah. It? But, but you know, but and a ceasefire with an eye towards negotiating. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't an end for U.S. support for the regime in South Vietnam. It wasn't an immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops from South Vietnam. It was certainly a step towards peace, but to the to the radical anti-war protesters, they sort of saw this as mealy mouth. They were they were like, well, why can't we just have peace now? <laughs> you know, why don't you just end the draft? Uh, let's uh, let let's make things happen much more dramatically. So, and and that's part of the generation gap. Uh, I think that that was in effect then and that we see now on college campuses where the people who are in power, rightly or wrongly, are going to be more conservative about how radical a move they can make. Uh, so the U.S. refusing to support Israel as an ally is something that probably you could count on two hands the number of U.S. politicians willing to do that. Um, the number of anti-war protesters on college campuses advocating for that 
there are thousands of them. Um, and both of those groups have arguments for their positions, but it's really hard for them to mesh. Uh, and this is one of the things that the 68 game gets at is that even though the protesters are generally going to support McCarthy, they, as the game goes on, become more and more frustrated with the Democratic Party as a whole. And this is the reason why some of them became revolutionaries, because they didn't see conventional American politics as capable of giving them what they wanted. The student that won as McCarthy, won the nomination as McCarthy, you said he managed to somehow bring over, bring in the protesters. And I imagine that includes the student that was playing Abby Hoffman. Is that a playable role? Um, it is. Uh, yeah, Abby Hoffman is a playable role. Uh, and um, th in this case, he wasn't able to bring in Abby Hoffman, but Abby Hoffman was so out of control, he sort of alienated the other protesters. <laughs> so it was this interesting play of personalities. Uh, and, and that's one of the other things that reacting games, I think, are good at, is they model these vast historical forces are operating but at the same time, the personalities of individuals are important. Uh, some people are are going to be able to do things that other people aren't. So then also one of the key defining aspects of the 68 nomination process, the DNC, um, is that I think the Democrats were not so certain uh, that they were going to win, right? So there was the moment in the DNC where the party, the delegates, had to all vote on the platform. That's the part of the DNC that doesn't exist anymore. We, the DNC drafts the platform sort of behind closed doors and pioneers it during the, uh, during the actual convention. Um, one of the planks of that platform is whether or not to call for a ceasefire in negotiations. Um, I imagine that part of that is that there were uh, contingents within the DNC that thought that they might be able to win over the support of the yippies and the protesters outside of the convention floor. Um, do you, I imagine that that no longer is available for, for this Democratic Party because um, I think everyone is pretty convinced that Kamala Harris will win and does not need the support of the pro-Palestine protesters. Do you think that's a fair fair um, summary yeah, of the two. I, 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 that's there. But I think also in 1968, the number of people in the convention that wanted to have anything to do with the protesters on the street was really small. Uh, so when there's the big police crackdown in front of the convention hotel, um, there, there are some protesters. Well, it's hard to know if they're protesters that were already affiliated with the McCarthy campaign, or they were protesters who were befriended by the McCarthy campaign. Um, and McCarthy goes out uh, after the convention is over to, to talk to some protesters and kind of cool things down. But he's just square. Uh, I, I mean, he, you know, he's wearing his suit and his tie and he's got his, he's got his tight haircut. And there's a degree to which he and Abby Hoffman, like, they're just, they're not even on the same planet culturally. Um, so I think that the disconnect now is not that different from the disconnect then. Um, there's a degree to which the establishment politicians are sort of paternalistic towards the students. And admire their passion, but then feel like they want to pat them on the head and say, I'm really glad that you're excited about politics. Maybe you should run for office, but they're not actually going to take any kind of policy suggestions from them. Uh, I think that that's as true now as it was in 68. I, I don't know if it's truer in one of those situations than the other. It sort of brings me to the fact that uh, about the violence around the DNC, which I think is what a lot of people are nervous about. What's drawing the, the com a lot of the anxious comparisons between 68 and 2024 is uh, the brutal police crackdown outside of the convention hall. Um, also, Dan Rather getting punched on the floor of the convention center. 
Um, and Dan Rather is a playable character for yeah for Chicago 1968. So I, I guess one of my questions is, do you think that the media, the role of the media was integral to how that election went for Humphrey and also the outcomes of the nomination process? Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the media plays a huge role in the way that the, the, sort of the campaign works, the way that the primaries were covered, the way that the convention is covered. Um, it's, it's on television, uh, and this really makes it part of people's lives in a way that even the convention in 64 wasn't. Um, I think that one of the things that gets overestimated sometimes is the level of sympathy for the protesters. Um, I think that people today imagine that there was a lot of sympathy for the protesters being beat down by the police for, for good reasons. In 1968, there wasn't a lot. Um, after the convention, a majority of Americans approve of the way that Mayor Daley handled the protesters. Um, the, the footage that I think a lot of people are familiar with of the police moving in on protesters on the street in front of the convention hotel, um, historically, this is a pretty small portion of the coverage of the convention. Um, so I think that it's, it's one of those times when, as historical distance increases, some of the aspects of it we want to increase, and we want to imagine that people responded to those events in the way that we think we would. Um, but the, the press does not give the protesters favorable coverage. Um, and... Part of this was that a lot of the protesters were really radical. And this is part of the game also, because there are a variety of different protester roles. And some of the protesters are trying to make the pro ensure that the protests are nonviolent, ensure that the protests don't result in a riot. And there are other protesters who want a riot. They think that this is a revolutionary moment and that the revolution will begin on the streets of Chicago. And they are completely wrong. Um, that sort of brings me to my last question quite nicely. Um, 68 was a crazy year, right? Um, MLK was assassinated April 4th, I think I already mentioned. RFK, who was quite popular among, I guess, people more moderate than the protesters outside of the convention, also assassinated. Um, there are sort of accusations of um, corruption and fraud about how the delegates are being se selected for the convention and also about how um, Humphrey gets nominated. Um, so if you could, as just a historian and also a video game or game designer, give your opinion on the zeitgeist. Do you think that the anger among the youth, among protesters of today, compares to back then? Do you think that, you know, people are expecting um, similar similar sort of uprising? Yeah, I, I think that some people are, but it, it really depends upon how close to the protests you are. So, so people that I know that have been part of the protests, the way that they see things often in my conversations with them is that it is a sort of a 1968 moment that people are frustrated, that people are potentially violent, that people have been radicalized. Um, but then I turn around and I talk to students in my classes and they're like, so Gaza's part of Israel? Um, like that's the level of knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that when people talk about the radicalization of college students in America, um, you're really talking about students at about 40 institutions. And uh, whereas in 1968, on my college campus, which is in central Iowa, it's a pretty conservative place, um, there was a protest on campus there were people who were members of Students for Democratic Society, which is a radical group. 
Um, I think that people on my campus are maybe plugged into those organizations online in a way that is much easier for people to plug in than it was in 1968, where you sort of had to go to Greenwich Village or go to Haight-Ashbury uh, or go to UC Berkeley in order to be part of that scene. So I think that more people are aware of it, but um, I think that it's it's not, it's not like there's a generational shift. Um, it's not like there's a politicization of youth. I, I don't think there really was in 1968 to the degree that we think there was either. But the fact that Americans are being inducted into service to go fight in Vietnam makes it proximate to young people's lives in 1968 in a way that the Israel-Gaza conflict is not unless you have family or cultural connections to Israel and Gaza. And that's millions of Americans, but it's nowhere near a majority of Americans. Well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for all the insight and good history that we, I feel like I learned today from you. Um, hope to talk to you soon and maybe about your book or about other of the games that you've uh, created. Okay, it was my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks.大家好，欢迎来到我们的华尔街争议节目。今天我们将深入探讨普京与中国总理李强的会晤，这不仅是两国领导人的友好交流，更是一个关于未来大规模合作计划的重大信号。普京在会中明言，俄中未来几年将展
也让外界对于未来的合作前景充满期待。普京在会谈中提到的人道主义领域的联合项目尤其引人注目。这一表态显示出俄罗斯对于与中国共同应对地区和全球人道危机的重视。在全球面临诸多挑战的当下，中俄两国的合作不仅限于经济领域，更延伸至社会责任和人道援助。普京的态度也让外界看到了俄罗斯在国际事务中寻求与中国携手共进的决心。李强此行不仅是一次正式访问，更是中俄合作关系发展的见证。普京的明确表态与李强的积极回应，标志着双方在未来将有更多的合作机遇。通过这样的高层交流，双方的战略互信不断增强，为未来合作打下了坚实的基础。在全球政治经济格局日趋复杂的当下，中俄两国的紧密联系无疑将对国际事务产生深远的影响。十月的金砖国家峰会将成为两国合作的新舞台，习近平的出席更是备受期待。这场峰会不仅是经济合作的平台，更是两国政治互信的重要体现。普京在会中提到的长远合作计划，将在这一盛会上得到进一步的落实。对于中俄两国来说，未来的合作不再是简单的贸易往来，而是战略伙伴关系的深化与拓展，预示着双方在国际舞台上将共同面对未来的挑战。总之，李强与普京的会晤为中俄关系注入了新的活力。也为未来的合作奠定了良好的基础。两国领导人的频繁互动，展示了中俄在全球事务中的重要地位。无论是经济合作，还是人道主义项目，双方的沟通与协作都将持续深化，预示着未来中俄关系的光明前景。随着时间的推移，我们有理由相信，中俄将携手并进，共创更加美好的未来。在当前的国际舞台上，中俄两国的关系就像一场持久的喜剧，仿佛两位主角正在演绎一出精彩的双人舞。这场舞蹈的最新一幕发生在莫斯科，当中国总理李强踏上这片土地时，俄罗斯总统普京正热情地向他挥手致意，并夸赞两国之间的贸易关系如同一棵长势喜人的树，枝繁叶茂。普京说道：“我们的贸易关系正在成功发展，这一切都要归功于我们的中国朋友。”听到这话，李强忍不住微微一笑，心里想：这下又可以在国际舞台上表现的像是最佳拍档了。在与俄罗斯总理米哈伊尔·米舒斯金会谈之前，李强和普京的握手便已经成为媒体的焦点，仿佛是一场政治上的握手言和秀。两位领袖之间的热情互动，让外界看到了中俄之间日益增强的合作与信任。米舒斯金不仅赞扬了两国之间的友谊，还批评西方国家对中俄的制裁行为，称这是一种不公平的竞争。听到这里，李强点头赞同，心中打算将这些珍贵的话语带回北京，告诉习近平，说不定还能在下次会议中派上用场。随着会谈深入，两国领导人签署了一系列协议，涉及投资、交通等多个领域，显示出中俄合作的深度与广度。米舒斯金甚至信心满满地表示，中俄关系作为强大的稳定因素，将会促进两国经济的增长。这样的豪言壮语不禁让人想起曾经的冷战时期。现在的中俄合作仿佛是要重写历史，让西方国家感到不安。李强在会后对外媒表示，中俄之间的贸易额已经达到创纪录的二十兆卢布，这绝对是一场盛大的经济派对。不仅如此，李强还强调了两国之间的友谊是坚固、不摇摆的，并表示这种友谊在国际风云变幻之际坚若磐石。这一番话在现场不仅引来了普京的微笑，也让在场的记者们忍俊不禁，感受到这对伙伴的亲密无间。他们的友谊就像是两颗星星，在这片充满变数的天空下闪耀着不屈的光芒。李强的话语不仅是对普京的支持，也是一种政治宣言，标榜着中俄关系的紧密与未来发展的信心。而在这次会议上，两位领导人之间的交流无疑是双方期待已久的盛会，并进一步加深了对彼此的信任与理解。李强提到，两国的外交关系已经走过了七十五个年头，这是一个值得庆祝的里程碑。他表示，中俄将在互相尊重、互信、友好互利的基础上。共同迎接未来的挑战，这种互信的表现不仅是政治上的承诺，更是一种对历史的尊重与未来的期许。再看当前的形势，中俄两国可谓是同舟共济，面对西方国家的挑战与制裁，两国的经济政策越发趋同，互相依赖的关系随之升温。李强在会议结束后对媒体说道：“中俄之间的合作是全方位的
，我们将携手推进双边关系，让它达到一个新的高度。这样的宣言无疑是对外界的一个强烈信号，表明中俄将在多方面携手共进，无论是经济、科技还是文化领域，双方都将攀登更高的峰顶。此次会议的成功，不仅让两国领导人对未来的合作充满信心，也使得中俄联盟在全球政治中发出的声音愈加响亮。在面对复杂的国际局势时，李强与普京的会晤如同一场华丽的交响乐，演奏出和谐而又坚定的旋律。未来的中俄关系，无疑将在这曲交响乐中继续演绎出更为壮丽的篇章。欢迎大家进入六度探索的辩论环节，我们从正反两个角度对本节目进行辩论，请出我们的辩论高手楚天书、谢琪琪。我是楚天书，我是谢琪琪。普京在与李强会谈时，强调了中俄两国的深厚合作关系，尤其是在经济和人道主义领域的联合计划。这显然是一个积极的信号，表明两国在面对西方压力时，愿意携手共进。历史上，中俄关系曾经历过多次波折，但如今已发展成为一种强有力的伙伴关系。根据统计，去年的双边贸易额已达创纪录的二十万亿卢布，这说明了双方经济互补的潜力和动力。对于中国来说，深化与俄罗斯的合作不仅可以增强经济韧性，还能为国家安全提供保障。正如古人所说：“君子和而不同。”两国可以在保持各自主权的同时，开展更深层次的合作。然而，楚天书，你不得不承认，中俄关系的加深也并非没有风险。普京的亲密接触可能会让中国在某种程度上陷入风险之中。历史上，中国也曾因与某些国家的过度依赖而付出沉重代价，比如与苏联的关系。在当前国际形势下，西方国家对中俄合作的警惕性日益增强，可能会导致更严厉的制裁和经济压力。中国的经济发展不应过于依赖单一伙伴，而应寻求多元化的合作，才能更好地应对未来的不确定性。正如老子所言：“道可道，非常道，灵活应对才是明智之举。”你提到的风险确实存在。但我们不能因为害怕风险而否定双方合作的潜力。在全球化的今天，单一的合作关系已经很难找到，反而是多元化的合作可以带来更大的稳定性。中俄合作在能源、贸易、科技等领域的深入，不仅可以增强两国的经济实力，还能在国际事务中形成合力，共同维护多极化的世界秩序。正如得道者多助，失道者寡助。我们需要拥抱能够共同发展的伙伴，而不是退缩。合作的理念很好，但现实世界并不是那么简单。中俄的合作关系在理论上显得很美好，但在实践中，两国的利益与文化差异可能会导致摩擦。我们不能忽视历史教训，尤其是中俄曾经的边界争端和地缘政治博弈。此外，全球经济格局正在快速变化。如果过分依赖与俄罗斯的合作，可能会在某些领域失去竞争优势。正如一位智者曾说：“不入虎穴，焉得虎子。”冒险与合作需要谨慎把握。谢谢大家收看《六度探索》，这是一个由科学家、经济学家、媒体人。工程技术人员合作建立的新型媒体，网友与六度 AI 参与合作完成各种内容，这些内容不能作为任何决策或法律的意见。这是一个新型的试验性媒体方式，我们希望得到大家的支持，修正错误。网友可以参与讨论，也可以向万能的六博士提出你能想出的任何问题。六度世界网址是六度 World。大家好，欢迎来到我们的六度解析节目。今天我们要深入探讨最近发生在中国新疆的引人注目的会议。新疆党委书记马新瑞与新加坡主权财富基金代马席的高层 executives 会面。这次会议的重点是能源领域，包括传统的石油、天然气和煤炭，以及新兴的风能和太阳能，显示出新疆对外资的渴求
。新疆以其强劲的风力和长时间的日照，在今年上半年新安装的新能源能力方面名列全国前茅。而戴马席则希望在文化交流和旅游方面加强与新疆的合作。这一动作不仅是新疆政府为了改善国际形象的努力，也是其在“一带一路”倡议中扮演核心角色的展示。不过，值得注意的是，尽管新疆当地官员积极促进经济发展，但该地区的人权争议仍然困扰着中国政府。但马席的高层虽然对中国市场保持谨慎，但仍然看好长期的经济发展。这次会议只是新疆与外国政要和企业交流的一部分，未来还会有更多动作。请大家继续收看详细内容。今天的节目的重点是新疆自治区党委书记马新瑞与新加坡主权财富基金淡马锡的高管会晤，探讨双方在能源投资及其他领域的合作。我们将对这次会议的背景、内容和潜在影响进行深入分析。首先，这一消息来源于《南华早报》。报道了马新瑞与淡马锡董事长林文星、执行董事兼首席执行官迪尔汉皮莱·桑德拉塞加拉的会晤。会议在新疆乌鲁木齐举行，旨在促进新疆的外资引入，特别是在能源领域。马新瑞指出，除了传统能源如石油、天然气和煤炭，新疆也在积极发展风能和太阳能等可再生能源。新疆地域辽阔，拥有强劲的风和长时间的日照，被认为在可再生能源的。装机容量方面具有极大的潜力。在二零二四年上半年，新疆在新能量装机容量方面位居全国第一，新增能力比去年同期翻了一番。这一数据不仅显示了新疆在可再生能源方面的快速发展，也反映了当局在推动经济多元化方面的努力。在会议中，淡马锡还对新疆的文化交流和旅游发展表示了兴趣。这一方面表明淡马锡对新疆市场的关注，另一方面也暗示新疆希望通过发展旅游业来改善其国际形象。尽管新疆面临国际社会的广泛指责，尤其是关于人权问题的指控，新疆政府却努力通过经济发展和文化合作来塑造更积极的形象。近年来，新疆政府在国际舞台上显得更加积极。马新瑞和其他高级官员与多个国家的外交使者及商业代表进行了多次会晤，包括与柬埔寨国王诺罗敦·西哈莫尼的会谈，以及与台湾企业家的接触。这些活动不仅是为了加强与外界的联系，也是为了展示新疆的投资潜力。淡马锡作为新加坡的国有投资公司，其投资组合在过去一年中仅增长了百分之二，达到三千八百九十亿新加坡元。这一增长主要受到美国和印度投资的推动，但在中国市场的表现不佳，使得整体增长受到制约。但马西高层表示，尽管对中国市场持谨慎态度，但并不会完全撤出中国市场。这样的表态反映出，但马西在面临地缘政治和经济放缓等多重挑战时，仍然希望保持与中国市场的联系。在当前国际经济环境复杂的背景下，新疆的投资机会显得尤为重要。随着“一带一路”倡议的推进，新疆被视为连接中国与中亚及欧洲的重要通道。通过吸引外资，新疆希望能在经济上实现自我转型，同时提升自身在全球经济中的地位。然而，必须注意的是，尽管新疆在发展经济、吸引外资方面表现出积极姿态，但其人权记录依然是一个敏感话题。国际社会对中国在新疆的政策及其对维吾尔族及其他少数民族的待遇表示关切，这一背景无疑对新疆吸引外资构成挑战。尽管新疆政府通过发展旅游和文化交流来改善形象，但外界的质疑依然存在。对于淡马锡而言，投资新疆不仅是寻求经济利益的机会，更是承担社会责任的重要体现。作为一家国有投资公司。但马西在投资项目时，需考虑其社会影响，包括对当地社区的影响及其与国际道德标准的契合度。但马西在新疆的投资能否有效促进当地经济发展，同时又不损害人权，值得关注。此次马新瑞与淡马西高管的会晤，标志着新疆在寻求国际合作方面迈出了重要一步。尽管面临诸多挑战，但新疆的战略地位和丰富资源，为其吸引外资提供了良好的基础。未来，随着国际形势的变化和新疆政策的调整，我们有理由期待这一地区会有更多的变化和发展。在全球经济一体化的大背景下，地方政府的积极作为与国际投资机构的合作将成为推动地方经济发展的重要动力。
，新疆的经历可能为其他地区提供借鉴，尤其在如何处理人权问题与经济发展之间的微妙平衡上。今天的讨论到此结束，感谢您收看我们的节目，我们将继续关注这一话题，并为您带来更多深入的分析与报道，请大家继续收看本节目的深入探索。谢谢大家收看《六度探索》，这是一个由科学家、经济学家、媒体人、工程技术人员合作建立的新型媒体。网友与六度 AI 参与合作完成各种内容，这些内容不能作为任何决策或法律的意见。这是一个新型的试验性媒体方式，我们希望得到大家的支持，修正错误。网友可以参与讨论，也可以向万能的六博士提出你能想出的任何问题。嗯